I'm really excited to be here today, and I thought the best way to start this morning would be to start with a story from my childhood, all right? And so we're going to go back to my teenage years, um, which is now like 20-some years ago, and uh, I grew up overseas. My parents are missionaries, and so we were in Nigeria. Um, it's in Africa. If you're looking at Africa, if this is, if I'm Africa, it's like right here, um, right in the armpit of Africa, and uh I spent 12 years of my childhood there, and I learned to drive there, which was awesome. But in this particular day, I'm driving down a dirt road in the bush, 50 kilometers from any paved road. Um, the truck I'm driving has been beat up. It's been flipped. It's been drowned. It's been all kinds of stuff, and it is still running. It's a rugged five-speed Toyota Hilux. You might be sitting here going, what's a Toyota Hilux? It's like a Tacoma, um, but it's what the rest of the world calls it. It's a Hilux. And so I'm driving down this dirt road. And there's a mound of sand in the middle, and then you got your tire tracks and then sand going up. And I'm going through the village, and there's a mud hut over here with some thatched roofs and some mud huts over here. And uh, little Nigerian kids running along, and they're going, Bature, 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 because that's what they called us. And, uh, uh, and, you know, you wave, you smile, and hope they don't run out behind you, because if you have to stop quickly, well. And um, so I look ahead, and there's a sheep. And it's walking in the same direction I'm going. And I'm in soft sand. I don't know if you've ever driven in soft sand on the beach, but you don't want to stop moving usually. And so I'm going down this road, and I'm honking the horn, and the sheep's just stumbling along, doing its thing. And, and I'm like, the sheep's got to get out of the way. They always get out of the way. Honk the horn. Now I can't see it because I know it's right there. And I'm just, I'm creeping. I'm like, oh, I'm sure he got out of the way. And I, I step into the gas and boom, boom. I'm like, uh-oh. I'm looking at the side view mirror, I'm, and, and things like sprawling on the side, and it, it, get, it gets its foot, and it stands up, and it kind of stumbles around, and takes off into the village. So, all that to be said, we need to agree on one thing this morning, that sheep can be dumb. <laughs> I honked the horn numerous times, I slowed down, he still didn't get out of the way, all right? My name is Micah Keach. I am the director of Rooted Student Ministries here at First United, and I'm really excited to share with you all this morning, but I want to recap our summer a little bit because summer is an awesome time in student ministry because we ramp things up. We have a lot going on, and so I'm, I'm going to kind of go through a few things, but how many of you agree that it's been hot this summer? Yeah, it's been real hot. So we started off the summer going tubing on the Rainbow River. I tell you what, there's no easy way to get into that water except to jump because it was cold. But we did the float. Uh, turns out we did the long float. So that's where I got my first real sunburn of the summer, as did a couple students. But um, we had a lot of fun together floating around. We ended up tying up to each other, so we just kind of float down the river. It was a peaceful day. Great way to, to usher summer in, because the next week we jumped right into Passion Camp, all right? And Passion Camp is a camp that comes to Daytona Beach, uh, it's put on by Passion City Church. See a couple of our uh, youth there uh, being silly. And 6,100 students and leaders in the Ocean Center. All right, 6,100 lift and high the name of Jesus. And it was just a really powerful weekend. So I'm just going to go over a few details here because they're important to the sermon today. Um, and, and because this is what our kids have the opportunity to experience during some of these events. So Grant Patrick, their youth director, he jumped right in, and he took off, and he, he told us that God is intentional, not customizable. First night, everyone's just getting settled in. He says, if we try to customize God to fit what we want, we leave power on the shelf. Whew. Yes, I'm like, this is going to be a good week. Louis Giglio comes in the next day with, am I enough? How many of us have ever asked ourselves that? Am I enough? I know I have. And so, he focused on our Heavenly Father and how each of us are children of God, that each of us matter. And then we go on a little farther, Levi Lusco, he, uh, he said, don't build your life on the sands of culture. When you don't know who you are, you'll never know what you're supposed to be. That was his morning talk. His night talk was about sex. And then Ben Stewart comes in, he talks about two rules of fighting. Two rules of fighting are... You gotta know you're in a fight. And then you gotta know who your enemy is, who you're fighting. And, and so he, he talks about that. And then Louis wraps it up with who is on my throne. All right. And so this is this is only the second week of June. And, and he he just 
this week was powerful, and the students were just soaking it in. It was like drinking out of a fire hydrant. And so, so we tried to help them uh, digest it as we go into summer. But he said, God is different, and so should we be as well. Stop riding around in the back seat of culture. It's time to get out. The next stop for summer was Adventure Week, right here. 197 children. When I say children, I mean fifth grade and below. That is awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't do that again. Um, you can see some of our, our youth leaders up there. Uh, they were awesome. And there's just something about watching one generation pour into the next generation, pouring into the next generation. It's beautiful. And so that week, the youth helped out. I think we had uh, 58 youth that helped out, 86 adults, volunteers that were helping with that. It was a really awesome week, powerful week, where the children got to experience God's love in this place and space. And from there, we didn't slow down. We headed straight to Warren Willis Camp, all right? Last week of June, we're at Warren Willis Camp. We got 20 students there, and the focus is on peace. And so we, we jump in, and uh, Scott was preaching to the high schoolers, and he jumped in with, uh, be peacemakers. How do we make peace with ourselves? You see this, this crew up here? Um, man, I love camp. And, and uh, then he, he jumped in further, and until we see the image of God in each person we meet, there is no peace. We are children of God. You're starting to see some common themes run here, aren't you? And we're just in June. But until we see everyone as a child of God, peace can't begin. And when you wrestle with God, you are going to be changed. And you can love someone and still disagree with them. And, and so that, that kind of wrapped up camp, and it was a really powerful week. It was cool to watch the students work through some things. I'm going to dive into a really cool aspect of camp a little later on. But then we came back, and June was over. <sighs> Next stop, we took a group of kids. We jumped on the sun rail over in Debury. We headed over to Winter Park. And I don't know if you've ever taken a group of teenagers um, to a place where you could go that way or you could go that way or you could go that way. What do you guys feel like doing? That's what it was. We got off at Winter Park. It's a beautiful place if you haven't been there. We walked around. We ended up checking out a candy shop. Um, and then we found ourselves back at a restaurant that we were at two years prior when we did this trip. And, and I'm like, you know, that's cool. The food was good. Uh, we, we enjoyed it. But we ended up gathering around the exact same table. Didn't, didn't try it. They just sat us there. And I was like, this, this is kind of cool, you know. Two years later, haven't talked to these people in two years, and they put us at the same table with our group. And so, so we gathered and we ate. And then no summer is complete without Deleon Springs. And I just want you all to know, if you haven't been there yet, they have made the water colder. <laughs> much, much colder. I seriously got in at one point and was like, I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. Um, and they told me, oh, it'll get better. I'm like, yeah, okay. But we did get out and go and eat pancakes, and that... I tell you, if you haven't made pancakes there, that is awesome. Um, the pancakes are delicious, and, and so we ate a lot of pancakes. You get to cook them right there in front of you, and we gathered around that table, and we ate, and we laughed, and we had a good time. And then I was so excited, Revive 225. We're headed back to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Youth group has been three years uh, prior, and it's a really powerful moment, you know. And we start preparing, and we got a group of 10 kids, and the really cool part is... Several of them hadn't been uh, highly active with the youth group, so this was a really great time for them to experience what was going on. I don't know if you've been to Louisiana, but the food, wow. The culture, awesome. And Revive 225 did a really good job of bringing in the community and experiencing that. So we're all excited. We're getting ready to go. And Hurricane Barry showed up. And we waited, and we're like, oh, it's going to blow over. It's going to move on. It didn't. It took its time, and it rained, and we decided that we probably shouldn't take a bunch of teenagers over there right now. So we stayed right here in Ormond Beach. Now we're kind of scrambling, trying to get our bearings, so we started doing some work in the youth space, some, some much-needed work, and uh, this group came together and leaned in to prepare this space down there to help refresh it, to help bring new life to it, and we worked together as a team. We got out, we had ice cream, uh, a bunch because that's always delicious, but it was a really awesome week here. Um, different plans than we originally wanted, 
but God works in awesome ways. And so that, that, that's kind of the basis of the summer so far for like events and things going on. We had a mystery trip last week that, you know, it's kind of crazy. It was a mystery trip and everywhere we ended up, we found ourselves sitting around a table. Wow. And then that's the, all that didn't include the Sunday night gatherings. We started talking in the summer about fighting injustice in our communities, in our worlds, in our lives. And, and the kids really leaned into that. And the last, I, I used a series of a uh, curriculum, and in the last talk, I had students, I had almost an entire group of students who hadn't been there for the first three weeks. How do you finish a series when they haven't been there for the first three weeks? You start over. You go back to the beginning of the series, and you start talking about it. And, and this group sat down around the tables that we pushed together, and they came up with practical applications that they can do using social media, using YouTube, to challenge our community, to challenge the businesses to make a difference. That if they were to achieve a goal that was set and this business agreed to it, maybe, maybe they can uh, donate that money to an organization that's fighting injustice in our community in our world. And so we're going to explore that as this semester goes on. We're really excited about that. And right now, we're talking, we're in a series that's, set, that's called Hear Me Roar. It's talking about being bold, and we're in the book of Daniel, and I don't know about you, but I love the book of Daniel. There, there's a lot in there. There's a lot of weird stuff in there, but uh, it, it's, it's really good. And so that's where we're at right now with the youth group, but I wanted to share all that with you as we get ready to uh, set the table for today, as we get ready to talk about these common threads. The common threads of being chosen, children of God, gathering, identity, community, power, unity. These are all common threads of this summer that this youth group has experienced. So you remember that goat or that sheep that I was talking about earlier, the one that I accidentally ran over? I'm, I'm a disclaimer here. I, this was not intended to, uh, to offend anyone, but we're about to jump into a really cool scripture, probably the second most uh, well-known scripture in in the Bible, in my opinion, uh, Psalm 23. But I want you to think about what it's like sometimes to be a sheep, all right? So we're reading Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This psalm is a journey. And in this psalm today, a lot of these common threads come together from our summer. For the beginning of the psalm is a picture of restoration and peace. The psalmist goes on to share how they have, a difficult, have had difficult times and God is right there when they've called on him. And he guides and he comforts. And when I'm reading this, sometimes when I talk about going through the darkest valley, I'll interject, you know, some of my darkest valleys, some of my fears, my anxieties, my struggles in life as I'm reading this so that it, it has that personal connection. And then there's the table. This is where we're going to park today for a little bit. We're going to talk about this and uh, explore some of these things here. I got uh, uh, Adam, you around here somewhere, bud? Need a little help uh, with a construction piece. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the history of a table. Hey, Billy, can you help him out? I know I didn't ask you before, but I'm putting you on the spot right now. You good? All right, cool. So, so they're going to work right here on, on a thing because I want to give you a history of a table. I love building furniture. I love building tables. Um, my Pinterest may or may not have 355 pins on my table board. Um, but uh, a table, historically, was not something that everybody had, all right? It was, it was an item that the wealthier had, royalty had, that people would gather. You were invited to gather around a table. And, and it wasn't always left constructed. And so while they would go on trips, they'd pack up the table and they'd take it with them, all right? 
And they'd, they'd be going down the road, and wherever they stopped, they'd decide, okay, hey, you know, maybe we need to, um, you know, we need to gather, eat, have a party, do whatever. And, and so the table has transformed over the years. Um, now we see them all over the place. In our youth room, we have three large tables. We just constructed one this last week uh, uh, during the mission time. It's about seven and a half feet long. It's about two and a half feet wide. It's on wheels. It's mobile. It's important. Um, so we got three tables that are about that size. And, uh, <laughs> and so um, we'll push them around. Sometimes we'll make a really long table. Sometimes we'll make a big, fat table. We'll gather around these tables and eat food. We'll play games. We'll talk. We'll solve the world's problems. We'll fight. <laughs> All right, you guys. You got good. All right. Good job. So the table is an important part of our, our community. You know, we, we go to restaurants. You know, one of the things that I, I thought was interesting, I don't know if it's a current trend or a new trend, but uh, when... go to a restaurant, have you ever been to one that has those really long tables? And you get sat at one end? You don't know the people at the other end? You're like, hey, we're at the same table. Or someone gets put in the middle. Don't know who they are. Sitting at the table with them. See, we, we've been told growing up, we need to choose who we surround ourselves with wisely, right? So that we make good decisions. You see, Building tables is easy for us. And when we choose who we want to surround ourselves with, we're missing out on something. It's a little contrary to what we may have uh, grown up with. So I want to ask a question. What nourishment are you finding at your table? You see, because it's your table that you've constructed, that you've surrounded yourself with, that you put together, you're missing something, and you don't get, you won't get it, it being the full power of God until you sit at the table. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You read that, that verse in rhythm? It comes after a lot has already happened. You've been on a journey. And so I picture my enemies, whomever they may be, whatever they may be, going, whoa, 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 whoa wait, time out. Your God is going to build that table for you, and then he's going to provide the feast for you that after what you just did? Are you kidding me? He prepares the table. You see, it tells us that we're welcome. He invites us that we're chosen, that we're children of God. We find our identity at this table. There is community at the table, even in the midst of our darkest valleys, but we don't get to fully embrace that community until we accept that the person that's sitting on the other side of this table, the one who knit us together in our mother's womb, who spoke the universe into being, calls us, meets us, and gathers with us amongst our imperfections, our struggles, addictions, fears, pain, death, and says, I love you. Period. You matter to me. Find peace at this table. That I, not you in your mortal state, but that I, your creator, have prepared for you. Don't give the enemy a seat because I have already defeated them. God is always with us when we cry out to him. He hears us. He prepares a table for us. I find comfort in this because then I realize that I am no longer alone. That he's been right there with me the whole time. He provides nourishment in my time of need. 
not the nourishment that I might have been getting from the tables that I put together, but real power and authority, nourishment that will overcome my fears, my enemies, my struggles. I talk about this because we can build tables like they're going out of style. I don't like this table, so I'm going to, ooh, look at that table over there. I like that table. I'm going to go, I'm going to go get that table. You know what? Oh, look who's sitting at that table over there. Yes, I I want to go sit. I want to be at that. I don't know who they are, but I want to be at that table over there, all right? Because these people, if they see me sitting at that table, yeah, I'm going to be pretty cool. They're going to they're gonna like that. You know what? Our, our youth, the students of our community sit at tables every day that don't have their best interests in mind. They'll see a table and be like, oh, I want to be at that table. And they'll sit down. And they're going on a journey. This is where you and I us are so important in their story and their journey. We need to sit at this table and get real with our creator and know what our identity is, what we were intended to do. This table needs to be our base, our platform, our common ground to gather in Christ's name to find nourishment. When when the youth see us gather at this table, maybe, just maybe, they'll see that there's a table for them. A table where they can find their identity. Because if you don't know who you are, you don't know who you're supposed to be. Once we see whose we are, what our identity is supposed to be, we can be confident knowing that God has our best interests in mind. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Imagine if you were invited to someone's table and they, they walk up beside you, you're like sitting down, you're getting ready to have a feast and they pour something on your head. Awkward. Not always. See, there's a lot of historical aspects to this, but when this scripture was written, this was a big deal because if you were anointed, you were worthy. If you were anointed, that meant that I want you here, that I want you to be around me. If you were anointed, that meant that I was going to protect you at any cost. Because you remember in the verse before where it says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The staff is for guiding the sheep because the sheep will go wherever the sheep want to go if you don't guide them. And the rod, that's made from the hardwood of the tree. That rod is a personal defense mechanism. If something comes after the shepherd's sheep, you better believe that shepherd is going to go after whatever it is. If it's a bear, if it's a wolf, if it's a lion, if it's your fear, your anxiety, God has chosen us. He has chosen you. He wants you to know that you are worthy. So not only has he prepared this lavish feast for you, this table for you to sit down, but he says, you are worthy, you are known, and you are needed. You matter to me. And he he doesn't just go, all right, great. That was a good talk. Hope you enjoyed the food. Did you get enough energy? Because you got to get back out there and, you know, fight your enemies. No. The next step is to gather together. And we find that in the New Testament in Ephesians. But... He doesn't just send us back out alone. This is a process. This is a step where we grow. And so in Ephesians, it says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of of all the fullness of God. How does this identity that you're finding at this table engage your community? It goes on in Matthew, it says, uh, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Identity in Christ moves together. We can't do it by ourselves seem kind of like a waste to say, thanks God, peace out, I'm going to jump back out there and take these guys on, I'm feeling good. 
Now it goes on from there. It says, my cup overflows. What's the only thing that can keep our cup from overflowing? When someone's serving you a drink at a restaurant and they're pouring water in your cup, what do you say? Oh, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. Thank you, you know? Only you can stop your cup from overflowing. Giving in to our fears, our anxieties. So I'm going to ask this question before I break down another um, aspect of the, of the scripture. But um, are you allowing your cup to be filled to overflowing? Because in Middle Eastern cultures, people would travel. And if they stopped at someone's house and they were invited to dinner and they sat down and their cup was filled up this much, that told them that when that drink is gone, you best be on your way too. Maybe if they thought they were pretty cool or they, they liked them some, they, they'd fill it up and they'd go, they'd go up there and they're like, hey, next time you're in town, I would love to see you. You should come back and hang out again. Um, but when that cup is empty, it's probably a good time to leave. But if the guests filled the cup and it got to the top and it overflowed, That said that you are worthy, that I want you here. That I want to do life with you. You know what? I got a spare room down the hall. You can spend the night there. You don't need to go back out into that dark world. You matter to me. So we're going to have to get a little uh, metaphorical here because I didn't have enough cups for everyone. Um, but we were at Warren Willis Camp this summer, and they had a station with the students, all right? And, and it was really powerful because all the students liked it. They thought it was really unique. It was made up of five cups, and these five cups were set up in a specific pattern, all right? There's four on the bottom and one up top, okay? And so they would create this, uh, this setting where the students would gather, and they could pour water into it. And they're talking about being filled up, okay? Uh, being filled to the fullest measure, like it says... In Ephesians, being filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Well, Psalm 23 tells us that my cup overflows, so I think that measure is overflowing. So me and my youth minister mind goes, I wonder how high we can stack the cups. And then I get to talking with the students, and they're like, yeah, that's really cool. And then I'm like, hey, I'm preaching. And they're like, hey, you should stack the cup thing, because that's really cool, so I'm going to stack cups. And we're going to talk about what it looks like when we apply a little bit of meaning to the layers of cups. Because each of our lives have layers. This bottom layer, we're going to call that the world. All right? Whatever you think the world would be. This is going to be a 386 right here. All right? Ormond Beach, Daytona Beach, Port Orange. That's the community around us. And this right here, this, this is our family. This is the people that are closest to us. You see, when we take our cup, who's, who's the only one that can stop our cup from overflowing? Us. So when we take that cup and we set it on top and allow the unending love of our Creator to pour into us, what happens? It keeps going. It begins to affect our family. It begins to affect our community. We need to allow God to continue to fill us because he will never end. And it goes on and on. See, beginning of uh, Lawrence's three weeks here on the pastor swap, he talked about Sunday as a culmination of a week spent in community sharing God's love, reaching out to the world around us, then gathering as a body and growing, getting the nourishment that we need to go back out and do it again. Because God's love 
is unending. He says, I've chosen you. You are important to me. You matter. And he continues to pour into us. See, the beginning of the summer started in fighting injustice. But it was out of Micah 6, 8. Micah 6, 8 shows us the heart of God. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There is power at the table. And when we sit with our Creator and experience His heart, we move in ways we didn't know we could. We move with His power and authority, not just with the parts of Him that we wanted or thought we needed. Because God is intentional, not customizable. When we sit at this table, our youth will see the importance of being grounded in the unchanging good news of Jesus Christ. And when they sit at this table, the world will see the importance of the unchanging good news of Jesus Christ. No longer surrounded by enemies, but by their creator in love to be spread to the world around them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this table before us. Lord knows we don't deserve it. But you are God of knowledge that doesn't make sense. Of love that overflows and we don't know why. May we allow ourselves to be filled to overflowing so that the world around us can experience your love. We thank you for the generations that follow, for the opportunity that we have to pour into them what you have poured into us. I thank you. And I look forward to an awesome week spreading your love in your name. All God's people said, Amen. All right, so let me get this straight. It's community. Mm-hmm. That's the world. My community. Your community, okay. My friends, my people I hang with. I said that one, but yeah, you can take that. You hang with people in 386? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Right. Family? Yes. Me? Yes. And so if I do this and let God pour into me, Filters down. That was good, man. Did y'all get that? Well done. As Michael was doing that, I thought about my life. I hope you thought about your life. Is it filtering down? Is what happens in here affecting those other levels? Or you just show up at the table and eat and go home? Do you let God's love flow in you and through you in such a way that the people down the line are getting filled up on what you're eating as well? Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runneth over. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks unto God, and he broke it and said, take and eat. I mean, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup. He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. The blood of the new covenant is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you should drink of it in remembrance of me. So my cup runneth over. Are you letting the love of God flow through you in such a way 
that all those other levels are filled up on the same love you're getting. Let's pray. God, we just ask that you pour out your spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of the bread and the cup and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That as we feast on them, we might experience your love and your grace. And may our cup run over. In the presence of our enemies and of our friends and of our family and of our community, may the love that you pour into us, may it overflow into everything around us and so that the world might be changed through you working in us. Then surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.